Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I am James Botti in Washington. Today is Thursday, February 16th, and here are some of the stories we are covering. With a little over a week before Nigeria's February 25 elections, will the ongoing currency swap crisis impact the vote? The challenges of cash and faced by Nigerians will most certainly have an impact and will affect the presidential election if it is not resolved before the 25th of February when the election will take place. Guinea's FNDC plans a nationwide protest today, Thursday, despite a ban by the military junta. Human Rights Watch says LGBTQ plus women face brutal attacks and discrimination. Kenya launches operation to weed out bandits. People of this region have no option. They must learn to coexist. This habit of um, one community attacking the other one will not be allowed to continue. We have the capacity and the will. And powerful earthquake shakes political fortunes in Turkey and Syria. Those stories plus our Black History Month and African History Facts for today, February 16, are coming up on Daybreak Africa. It's a little over a week before Nigeria's February 25 presidential and parliamentary elections, but could the ongoing currency crisis impact both the voting process and the outcome? The country is in the middle of swapping its currency, the Naira, from old notes to new ones. There were protests Wednesday around the country over the cash swap policy and the scarcity of some Naira notes. Some opposition politicians are telling their supporters to express their anger over the issue by voting against the ruling All Progressive Congress Party on Election Day. Shuaibu Idris Mikati is a Lagos-based financial and management consultant. He tells me the currency issue and other economic challenges could impact the elections if they are not resolved before February 25. I believe most sincerely that uh, the challenges of cash faced by Nigerians will most certainly have an impact and will affect the presidential election if it is not resolved before the 25th of February when the election will take place. A situation where citizens are not able to buy food, a situation where citizens are not able to buy any of the essential items that they require for our daily life, then obviously the date of the election, uh, there may be a bit of challenge. Why did the government decide to bring about the issue of the currency during the election year? Honestly, your case is as good as mine. Quite a number of us have had uh, our voices against the timing of this currency redesign or change or what have you. We have a country that is largely a section of it is insecure. You know, we are having general elections. We have had flood disaster. And then we want to do population census. And at the same time, in the same period, we want to design currency. Having five projects concurrently, even, you know, first world economies like uh, UK or continental Europe or US, we may not be able to grapple with this five projects to be done in rapid succession. I mean, it, it baffles us and it beats our imagination. How does this or how would this impact the work of the Elections Commission? You know, uh, the beauty part of uh, what the Election Commission is doing, much of it is uh, technology-based. The ad hoc staff that uh, would have been uh, hired by now and trained, the Election Commission would have had their account numbers or most probably their stipends or allowances will just be wired to their account. But the challenge, if I'm one of those ad hoc staff, if I don't have any other source of cash, how do I transport myself from, say, my house to the location where I'm supposed to render service on the date of the election or on the day prior to the election or the day after the election? This is why I say the cash crisis certainly affect the presidential elections if not resolved. On one side, they may be able to transfer money to the account of the ad hoc staff, but on the other side, the ad hoc staff may have challenge accessing the money because the banks are not dispensing the cash 
and the fuel operators, that is the point of sales terminal operators or the agents, are also not able to dispense so much cash. And even when and where they dispense the cash, they charge exorbitant fees. You want to collect 5,000 naira, they ask to pay 1,000 naira. So you either give them uh, 1,000 naira and uh, get 5,000 naira, or they deduct 5,000 naira from your account and give you 4,000 naira. How many people will be ready to accept such a punitive charge? And uh, that is even when and where they are able to get the agent that is ready to give them the 4,000. Now, Shuaibu Idris Mikati, a financial and management consultant, he was speaking with us from Lagos, Nigeria. In Guinea, the National Front for the Defense of the Constitution, FNDC, and opposition political parties have called for a nationwide protest today, Thursday, to denounce the military junta's management of the transition process. The military government, led by Colonel Mamandi Dumuya, dissolved the FNDC last year, accusing it of organizing armed demonstrations and acting like a private militia. Journalist Karin Kamara, who is in the Guinean capital, Conakry, tells me the protesters say they have a constitutional right to demonstrate. They are planning to protest because, one, they are accusing the junta of uh, managing the transition on their own without wanting to involve them. And they are also accusing the junta of um, carrying a witch warrant against many opposition leaders, many of whom have fled the country and are now living in self-imposed exile because, uh, they are, according to um, their supporters, they say uh, the junta want to use the general justice uh, to cramp on them. Karim, let me ask right. you, the military junta has banned protest. How does the FNDC want to do the protest if there's a ban on protest? Well, they say they are not going to succumb to that ban because they say uh, the Guinean constitution gives them the right to demonstrate. So therefore, they are going to protest. And even this is why they've called on Guineans to come out today massively to join the protest, to show to the junta that um, uh, the population is with the opposition, not with the military junta. So therefore, they do not have the right to manage the transition alone and on their own without consulting Guineans. So, Karim, it's been over a year since the military take over. What is the situation like in Guinea? Yeah, uh, one, the situation is very difficult, very hard. Life is very hard for ordinary Guineans. There is economic crisis. Prices of basic food items is just um, them hiking on daily basis. The employment also is a problem. And this is why even the Guineans, they, they are disappointed in the junta because for them, they thought the junta would bring more them. They supported the coup widely, but now they say, I uh, did know President Alpha Conde would have remained to continue and um, his term of office because uh, the junta, the promises they came with, now they have really diverted uh, the attention from those, those promises they took to Guineans that Guineans. And then um, you can uh, see it visible on the, on the faces of Guineans that um, they are disappointed in the junta. And many have expressed this verbally to say, look, we regret even the departure of the former government because these international institutions, these donors, they are holding back their financial projects in Guinea. Most of them, not many, not all, but many of them, they these big um, um, companies. So and money is not flowing at all, and then the and offices... Things are not working rightly for, uh, for ordinary Guineans at all. You mentioned uh, political parties. Where are all the political leaders? I talked the other day with a member of the opposition, Faya Milimuno. What happened to Selu Dalin Diallo? Is he in the country? Well, Selu Dalin Diallo is out of the country. He's now on self and post exile somewhere around in the sub region. And also, we have another one called Sidia Ture, who is also in, in, on, in exile and also in the sub region. People are saying that even the junta is saying that um, they've committed some economic dishonesty. So they say they should pay for that. And then because of that, these guys are afraid and they don't want to return to the country for the time being. Karim, thank you so much. A pleasure talking with you on Daybreak Africa. Thank you very much, and thank you. I was journalist Karim Kamara speaking with us from the Guinean capital, Kunakri. The World Food Program says it is working to provide half a million people in West Africa with climate insurance. The WPF says it will distribute over $15 million in cash transfers to families and nutritional support for young children and nursing women from March until May in Burkina Faso, the Gambia, and Mali. The organization notes that farmers in the region suffer loss and damage to their crops and livelihoods due to extensive drought in the 2020. 22 agricultural season. Since 2019, the WPF has worked with the African Risk Capacity Unit of the African Union to provide climate-related insurance policies to nearly 5 million people in six African countries. (music) 
You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I am James Barton in Washington. Today is Thursday, February 16. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Kenyan security forces have launched an operation to clear bandits from its northern Rift Valley region and recover illegal firearms. Critics have voiced concern that the operation, led by army-backed police, could lead to abuses. Mohammed Yusuf reports from Nairobi. Kenyan police, backed by the military, are conducting an operation in the Rift Valley region to root out bandits who are attacking communities and security forces and stealing people's livestock. President William Ruto issued the order after three police officers were killed and eight others injured in an ambush in Kainuk, Turkana County. Bandits have attacked communities in the country's northern region for decades, with stolen livestock blamed for most of the conflict. Kenya's police chief, Jafet Kaome, urged communities to stop attacking each other after visiting Turkana County Tuesday. People of this region have no option they must learn to coexist. This habit of um, one community attacking the other one will not be allowed to continue. We have the capacity and the will. Ahmed Mohammed, the head of the Center for Security and Strategic Studies, says the bandits are interested in stealing animals. We cannot face any formidable force, whether it is police or military. In fact, right now, right now, they're gone. Gone where? They're in towns. Not in the, in, in, in the jungles you are fighting there. No? They've gone. They're not just you. You'll see them. You'll be alone there for a while. You'll run around. you look for weapons. You'll force people. You will, uh, 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 you know, do your own. But right now, they're not there. They're not there. They're in towns back in their uh, normal uh, activities. The government has given the bandits three days to surrender their weapons. Last week, suspected bandits sprayed bullets into a vehicle carrying passengers, killing three people, including a student in Turkana County. Drought, according to Pokot South MP David Kosing, is to blame for the current tensions and conflict between his community and the Turkana tribe. There's no order of grazing or, or, or let's say, drinking water. And therefore, the Pokot can push themselves to the river, and maybe this river is on the side in terms of administration of Turkana, and the Turkanas feel that they are being intimidated or they, th- they think that uh, Pokos are coming to their own land, and vice versa. And that is the reason why there's a lot of conflict, is the competition for grass, which is now very high along that area. The conflict over pastures and water for the animals has heightened tensions in the area and halted other civilian and government activities. Kenya is one of the countries in the region that is currently affected by the drought. Drought has affected 23 counties, including Baringo, Laikipia, Samburu, West Pokot and Turkana. Mohammed says the government will need to provide more resources and development in the affected region to stop animal theft. Those communities have lost a lot of animals. A lot of animals. They have they have gone down in terms of numbers, and therefore, when they see others who are doing well, they'll definitely go for them. Definitely. So the drought, climate change, definitely has had an impact. So that's why we are saying also, as part of the future plans, the government must think about development, think about life beyond the livestock and all that. Other means that it will be used to help the people sustain their lives. Kosing fears the security operation may bring more problems for his people than good. Out of sixteen divisions in West Bogot. Three are in distress. So sometimes when you, when, you, when you unleash operation, then they can actually even make everybody a criminal. Uh, the past has been that it's criminal, a criminalizing society, and that's my fear. Number two, that there's been incidences of rape in the past. There are incidences of, of hunger, roadblocks. You might remember some few, some few months ago, there were roadblocks in, in, in Tiati, and people almost died. 16 schools were closed in Tiati. The operation will also include the recovery of stolen livestock and patrolling major roads to ensure the free movement of people and goods. Mohamed Yusuf, VA News, Nairobi. 
Tunisia's president says some of the people detained in a wave of arrest are responsible for price increases and food shortages. According to Reuters, President Kai Saeed said during a meeting with the country's trade minister that he wanted to clean the country of, quote, traitors who want to fuel a social crisis. He did not give any details on which detained people he was referring to or their connection with food scarcity and inflation. Reuters says economists attribute the shortages which have affected subsidized products to a crisis in public financing as the state attempts to avert bankruptcy while negotiating an international buyout. LGBTQ plus women and non-binary people around the world continue to face violence from security forces, family members, and members of the public. A Human Rights Watch report released on Tuesday this week says widespread discrimination of the community prevents the building of relationships, homes, and families. The report also indicates that attacks on more feminine presenting LGBTQ plus individuals and couples in public cause them to limit their movements. Maureen Ojiambo reports. In the 211-page report by Human Rights Watch, term, this is why we became activists. LGBTQ women activists have condemned violence inflicted on lesbians, bisexual, transgender, and queer women. The report was motivated by lack of research and policy that focuses specifically on their rights. Human Rights Watch interviewed their defenders working at the local or national level and found out that most of the women are denied essential services based on their sexual orientation. Bianca Wilson is a senior scholar at the William Institute of the University of California, Los Angeles School of Law. She says trans women face a lot of challenges, including the denial of health care services. Homelessness or unstable housing, this is particularly among trans women. For most of these data sets, I'm talking about anyone identifying as a woman. So really, this was about sexual minority status among, among women. Um, poor overall health. And depression, it's the one area where we don't see these racial distinctions, that kind of intersectional disparity. It's pretty much across the board among women. According to the World Bank data, in 40% of countries worldwide, women do not have equal access to own, rent, administer, or inherit property. Human Rights Watch says the number presents an often challenging economic and legal barrier to LGBTQ couples. Jin Chong is a founder and executive director of Asian LGBTQ Network. She says trans women in her region face a lot of homophobia, a matter that needs to be addressed. Our findings in Asia has found that women who identify as LGBTQ persons are particularly affected by gender-based violence, where the gender in particular and sexual orientation is targeted. Asian countries actually, <laughs> religious extremisms, where we can see Brunei being gay means you can be stoned to death. In its report, Human Rights Watch has identified key areas they say need immediate research, funding and policy reform. The examples include forced and coerced marriage to men, labor rights and sexual violence at work, violence by security forces against masculine presenting women, unequal property, inheritance and land rights, legal restrictions of women's movement and violent attacks on LGBTQ couples in public, parental rights and access to fertility treatment. Researcher and report author at Human Rights Watch Erin Kilbraid says these areas have been underfunded by donors. That reporting on LBQ issues is chronically low. And so as researchers, it is incumbent upon us to wonder why it is that research is so low, right? And to address this issue of lesbian invisibility in human rights documentation. Not to say that it's a God-given fact that lesbians are invisible, but to think about how the methodological choices that we're making are further invisibilizing lesbian issues. Why is it that we say violence against LBQ people is inherently harder to research? Human Rights Watch suggests that donors should fund LGBTQ-led movements for land, environmental, migrant, and disability rights. It also says that government authorities should conduct thorough, transparent investigations into reports of violence against individuals and couples and develop laws, policies and protocols that protect the rights of LGBTQ women. Reporting for VOS Daybreak Africa, I am Moreno Jumbo in Sacramento, California. 
Last week's disastrous earthquake has shaken the political fortunes of leaders in Turkey and Syria. Analysts say some see a possible accelerated path to regime normalization for pariah Syrian President Bashar Assad, while an onslaught of criticism has engulfed Turkish President Erdogan, calling into question his re-election bait. For VOA, Dil Gavlak reports from Amman. More than a decade of conflict and blocked borders to aid deliveries have hampered access to the rubble-held area of northwest Syria, decimated by the powerful quake from the nearby Turkish epicenter. Turkey has received the lion's share of international assistance to date. The Norwegian Refugee Council and 35 other non-governmental organizations are demanding increased support for Syria's affected areas, saying the humanitarian response must match the scale of the disaster. Syria expert Charles Lister of the Washington-based Middle East Institute said it shouldn't surprise us that the Assad regime is willing to take advantage of a catastrophic natural disaster to serve its own interests, citing Syrian government appeals to the United Nations and aid deliveries from the United Arab Emirates, Jordan, Iraq, and Italy. But he warned against lifting sanctions on the government to further its normalization. He spoke to the Italian Institute of International Political Studies. But the main area of exploitation that we've seen from the regime so far is for its demand for the sanctions relief. There is no correlation between the sanctions imposed on the regime by the United States, the European Union, Canada, or the United Kingdom in the delivery of humanitarian aid. In 2022, the billions of dollars of aid that flowed into regime areas through Damascus, 91% of that was funded by the four sanctioning entities. Lister added that we do probably appear to be on an accelerated path toward normalization of the regime, but a lot of it will depend on how the regime responds, whether it is stubborn or more pragmatic as it deals with requests for further aid and how it deals with the governments that continue to press against it. Meanwhile, analysts say Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has come under fire for his government's reaction to the earthquake as the death toll rises in the southwest and affects his chances of re-election. Dorothea Schmidt heads the Turkey and Middle East program at the French Institute for International Relations in Paris. Erdogan was already in a slightly delicate situation because he has not always been leading the polls last year. Everybody's wondering whether the popularity of party is going to be damaged by the difficult response to the earthquake. The party is really on the front line to confront the growing anger from the local population. Schmidt adds that there's a debate whether Erdogan's government is totally unable to cope with the situation, or if any government would be completely helpless given the magnitude of the earthquake. Del Gavlek for VOA News, Amman. February is Black or African American History Month here in the United States. The idea for Black History Month began on February 1, 1926, as Negro History Week by Dr. Carter G. Watson. It became a month long celebration in 1976. Here now are some African American and African history facts for today, February 16. On this day in 1923, blues singer Bessie Smith, known as the Empress of the Blues, made her first recording. It was called Down Hearted Blues. Smith sang about things in life that gave people the blues things like poverty, racism, and love that is not returned. Her songs capture the sadness and joy of many African Americans. Also on this day in 1970, Joe Frazier became world heavyweight boxing champion after knocking out Jimmy Ellis in the second round at Madison Square Garden in New York City. 